For Korea Media's Policy, I'm Sashni Madli. Joining me today is author and journalist Roy Azakowitz, here to discuss his co-authored book with the late award-winning journalist Jeremy Gordon, High Times. So your book, co-authored with the late Jeremy Gordon, follows the life of Joe Berger, Michael Majak, who became one of the biggest weed smugglers in North America. Can you give us some brief insights into Michael's life growing up in Joburg and his introduction into drug smuggling? Michael grew up very much like I did and a year ahead of me in King David Primary School, Linksfield, which was the only Jewish school in, in Joburg at the time. And so we've known each other for a long time, but not well. He was a year ahead of me and he was always one of the popular kids and one of the wild kids. He had a charisma, even as a child, that magnetized people, brought them into him. And he became vice head boy of King David in the high school. By then, I'd, I'd gone to another school years before. And he had a typical, I guess, Joburg white uh, growing up experience until he, like me and many others, discovered weed when we were about 16 or 17. And that pretty much changed everything. We grew a little anarchic in our thinking and, and in the way we lived. Michael had a Canadian passport. His father was Canadian, so he never had to do the army. In 1969, uh, the army was compulsory, but uh, he, he left the country. He didn't have to do it because he had a foreign passport. And really, after being young and after discovering weed, all we wanted to do was discover more. So he, he went to London and then to Vancouver and uh, slowly understood that um, he could make money out of it. That's how he began. Your book opens, surprisingly, with the story of his arrest in Canada yes. in 1991. Yes. Can you just tell us a bit of, about his arrest and about how the American feds infiltrated his plans? Yes, the deal for which he finally was busted and went to prison for many years was huge. 72 tons, which is a shipload. It's not, not something you can fit onto a canoe or, or a yacht. It's a, it's a shipload. And in fact, as I tell in the book, it was the second ship because the first one had, had uh, some unfortunate accidents and stuff. So they had to get another one. And it came by sea from Afghanistan to the Western uh, approaches to America, Canada. And the feds infiltrated the scheme. What Michael had done is get a friend of his to hire a big fishing boat to go out into mid-ocean to offload all the dope from the, uh, the ship that was bringing it from Afghanistan. And that's where the feds came in. One of the guys they approached spoke to the FBI, and so by the time the ship actually neared Canada, but was still in international waters, there was an entire U.S. Navy flotilla of two destroyers and a whole bunch of, of helicopters following this boat bringing the hashish, and eventually they, uh, they seized it. Now, can you talk to us a bit about the legal drama that played out after his arrest and also Michael's experiences with the American penal system? Well, the legal issues were, were fascinating because um, the, the ship was intercepted by the U.S. Navy in international waters. And therefore, it fell under an unused piece of legislation in the American legal system. And that was used in the first trial, it went on appeal, it was used in the second trial, and it became part of case law, American case law, which means if you go and look up US versus Medjuk on the internet, you'll see tons of material about it because it did constitute a precedent for the usage of that, that piece of, of legislation. Uh, as far as the prisons are concerned, he was sentenced to 24 years in prison in the US. He spent 14 and a half in prison before he was released because he cooperated with the authorities. And he was in 
both medium and high security prisons, including the high security in Florence, Colorado, which is said to be one of the meanest of all American prisons. So he experienced a lot. Now, like you said, he was eventually released from prison early, but his freedom was short-lived. Can you tell yeah. our viewers why he was arrested again? Yeah, his freedom lasted for all of 14 months. I'll put it this way. Michael's ego was invested in being a drug kingpin. In other words, when that was taken away from him, when he was no longer a drug kingpin, his ego was nothing and he did not thrive. So when he got out of prison the first time, he really tried to regain his lost status as a drugs kingpin. By that time, the market had changed and cocaine was where people were making money a lot more than, than hashish. He financed a cocaine deal. He wasn't really part of it. He didn't participate in him, himself, but he, he financed it, I think, to the tune of $150,000, something like that. And when that was busted, he was drawn into that and busted for a second time as well and sentenced to nine years in prison in Spain. And Roy, can you tell us what it was like working with Michael to get his story on paper? And what lessons do you think he's learned from his life over the years now as a 73-year-old man? Michael lives in Mexico on the Pacific coast. So we communicated primarily online by Zoom or WhatsApp or whatever. And over the course of about three years, I recorded something like 70 hours of conversations, maybe a little more. Michael is a charismatic person and a good storyteller. So really, for me, the major issue was not getting his stories, but later getting everything into order, because 70 hours of recording is a lot of hours to go through and put into some sort of shape. So it took us uh, a long time. And then after that, we had to decide what went in, what didn't go in. And for that, Jeremy was very helpful. Jeremy was killed pretty early on in the writing process, but he was very much involved in the recordings and in the organizing of the material. And so the, the structure was very influenced by Jeremy. Michael's life today as a 73-year-old, well, when you read the book, you come to the understanding that Michael is pretty irrepressible. He, he, act, he doesn't stop. He's got incredible energy, always up for something new, something different. But I think he's learned that he really doesn't want to repeat the mistake he made twice. So he's keeping, as far as I know, on, this, on, on the right side of the law. And I think his life today, today he's got grandkids who live in Vancouver and he visits them or they visit him. He's not allowed back into the U.S. He hasn't been into the U.S. since his release. He's in a seaside resort. There's a lot of expats, people he can talk to and tell his stories to. And he's tremendously excited about the book. And lastly, Roy, you mentioned your co-author and friend, the late Jeremy Gordon, yes. who you dedicate the book to. Yes. Um, what made you decide to continue with the book after his death? It was very difficult. I've known Jeremy. We met, I think, when we were 13, and uh, we were closest friends uh, ever since. Uh, we lived together in, in, in different countries. We were extraordinarily close. He was killed in a home invasion uh, in April last year. And... For me, as, as for all his friends, it, it, was, it was a huge shock. But once I got over, so I took some time off a week, maybe two weeks, I didn't write. And I wasn't sure that I would continue. But, but I realized during that period that, uh, that I had to continue and, and that for, it, it, it was really the way I could, uh, in my own way, mourn Jeremy and dedicate something to him. And once I got back to writing two weeks or so after Jeremy's death, I sat for 10 months and I just knocked it out. 
That was author and journalist Roy Azakowitz discussing his co-authored book, High Times.